Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Everything Co-op. This morning, I am in St. Paul, Minnesota, at the National Conference on Black Cooperative Agenda. So the National Conference on Black Cooperative Agenda started in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, and they have conferences every year, this year in St. Paul as the host city. They are looking at networking and collaboration, uh, networking like-minded people, mainly black folk, that are interested in social wealth building and economic wealth building. And you can hardly get that without political wealth. So it's looking at all aspects of wealth building in black communities. And one way of creating wealth is through education. And so the National Conference on Black Cooperative Agenda is looking at educational opportunities to engage the participants in informative workshops and panel discussions. Also look at showcasing success stories throughout the U.S. as different co-ops that have been started and have been successful throughout the U.S. And sometimes going to the Caribbeans and other parts of the world. And of course... It's very difficult to talk about success in the black community if you don't look at youth engagement. So that's one of the other things that they're going to do here this week as it's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at this conference, which I am at this morning. And we're waiting on the mayor of St. Paul to come and join us. His name is Mayor Melvin Carter. He's a very young black man and engaging, very, very knowledgeable human being. So we're waiting on him to come on and get his view on co-ops and creating wealth in the black communities, well, in all communities, but particularly low-resourced communities. Those communities, black, brown, native communities that have been disenfranchised in the U.S. with racial policies that have basically hurt us. And Mayor Marvin Carter is coming on. Good morning, Mayor Carter. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing real well. I appreciate you having me on. I'm glad you took time. I know you've got to be extremely busy. I'm glad you took time out of your schedule to come and join us and talk to us this morning. I was just telling the audience uh, that we're here in St. Paul at the National Conference on Black Cooperative Agenda. And you're going to be speaking here tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Glad to have the folks in town uh, loving a chance, uh, an opportunity to share our work here in St. Paul. And great to be here. And I was really pleased to read about you and, and your success but tell me first, tell the audience, where did you grow up and what's your education? Sure. Um, I grew up right here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I'm a fifth generation St. Paulite. Uh, my, uh, I guess, great, great, great grandparents came to St. Paul from Paris, Texas. Uh, after there was a large fire in Paris, Texas that ended up uh, displacing a lot of the African-American community there. Uh, they wanted to get kind of as far, I think, geographically and socially from Texas as they could at the time. Was it like uh, and found their way? Was it like Tulsa? Was it fire committed to move people out and take over? You know, I, I think um, at best, I can say I think that it sounds like there's some sus suspicious kind of activity around there. Okay. Um, certainly, you know, it, it, it was Texas at the turn of the century. I think fire is 1916 or something like that. 
And, you know, as I've read about kind of the conditions in Paris, Texas at that point in time, you know, it, it was a town in which uh, the, the, the black community was uh, very victimized by an active Klan presence, but what was also the workforce of the town. And so, again, based on reports that I've read, the Klan would sort of patrol the city limits at, at, at night to keep people from leaving. And so, you know, my, my, my understanding is that my great grandparents uh, fled in the middle of the night. Like, I literally had to flee uh, Paris, Texas in 1916, uh, found their way up to St. Paul, uh, and found their way onto an avenue called Rondo. Rondo Avenue uh, was this kind of thriving, vibrant center cultural space uh, in St. Paul, uh, where my grandfather grew up, where my dad grew up. Uh, and where in the 50s, uh, our, our community, uh, along with our federal government during the interstate movement, um, uprooted uh, this historic, thriving, vibrant African-American community to build a freeway. Uh, I assume you may know that's a story that played out in cities all across our all, country. All across uh, the U.S., all across, yeah. That's exactly right. And in St. Paul, uh, which, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're growing but, you know, nobody's ever said St. Paul is a chocolate city necessarily. But in St. Paul, we look and we have a study that shows that in today's dollars, that freeway coming through stole over $150 million in African-American wealth from our community. Uh, and uh, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. I'm Mayor, um, can you say that number again? Uh, well, the number I think the study showed was $157 million dollars in uh, wealth in the African-American community. My grandfather owned, or I guess I should say my grandparents owned, I think, uh, six or seven commercial properties on Rondo. Uh, and, you know, this was, it was a place where, you know, dentists and doctors and uh, you know, kind of community gathering and business owners and things like that. And, you know, that was before some of the laws that require environmental impacts that studies and things like that. Uh, and so, you know, folks were given pennies on the dollar. They weren't given fair process uh, for, uh, the properties that were taken to build the freeway. Uh, and uh, long story short, I don't own a half a dozen commercial properties today. Your family doesn't own it. And they come in with uh, eminent domain That's right. and take the property to better America by providing highways. Highways are great. But they went into black communities and then gave pennies on a dollar. It's not fair market value. That's and right. therefore, we lost we as a people right. lost. Yeah. Okay. Over and over and over and over and over again. And the reason to me, I, I like to share that $157 million in St. Paul a lot so people understand the breadth. But if we're talking about a, a phenomenon that occurred in Detroit and in Atlanta and in Oakland and in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, uh, cities that have much larger African-American populations than even we do in St. Paul, um, if the St. Paul number is $157 million, then we are talking literally about billions of dollars of African American wealth uh, that that one generation ago uh, was stripped from our African American community nationwide. Honestly, as we talk about reparations for American slavery, uh, I think there's actually a, a a a different conversation that ought to be had about reparations for that harm that was done. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, my grandfather worked in the mines in West Virginia. My father worked on the railroad. We didn't have commercial property, so we wouldn't have lost that, but we also didn't have the opportunity to get it in Bluefield, West Virginia. And when you start in yeah. Charleston, West Virginia, I had a close friend that worked for the highway, and, and they put the highway right through the black community in Charleston. There's a lot of That's uproar right. about that. And it, it might right. be worth $50 million today. It's a very much smaller African-American community. But, yeah, it's... Uh, how have well, we and, been disenfranchised? And Brian, to, to be clear, most of the properties that were taken on Rondo were residential properties. 700 homes were taken uh, on Rondo. Okay. You know, folks just kicked out of their homes. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it had a, a, a huge uh, displacement effect. Uh, it had a huge economic effect uh, that we still feel today in St. Paul and, and, again, across the country. And it's something that we, we ought to think about. So all that to say is, We've been really intentional in St. Paul about one understanding that from economic development uh, to transportation to public safety, the goal, you know, there, there's one thing to say we want to help as much as we can uh, and we want to take a little bit of help and turn it into a lot of help. 
But there's also another thing to really recognize. There's a legacy of public policy decisions in America. And I'm not talking dating 400 years ago. Uh, I'm talking very, very recently uh, that uh, have not only not maximized the help that they can do, but have been uh, public processes and public decisions uh, that have really hurt people. And so, you know, the, the first things first for us is to figure out how to put ourselves in, in the driver's seat of a city government uh, that can be relevant in people's lives, uh, positively relevant in people's lives, that can listen really closely to what people are telling us in community and think through how uh, we're responsive and, um, and doing the opposite for our communities than, you know, some of those horrible legacies that we've seen around the, around the country. So what are some of the things that you're doing to build up this this legacy, to build up wealth, social and economic wealth? Yeah, our, our goal, and we say it all the time, is we're betting on ourselves. You know, I think there's a the historic model of city building that we've seen really isn't about people at all. It's about uh, bricks and mortar. It's about roads and houses and buildings and uh, changing the skyline and things like that. You know, that, that in this traditional model of city building, Vernon, um, if I, you know, get a new building built on our skyline and increase our tax base, folks will look at me and say, oh, he was a success. Whether people can feed their children or not, whether people can pay their rent or not, that's not a good enough model for us because it leads us to always look at the new thing and we're betting against our own residents. It, it, it leads us to try to find a business in Houston or Miami somewhere to move here. Uh, it leads us to build a road over 700 homes. Uh, it leads us to a public safety strategy uh, that says just lock up all the black and brown boys that we can find. And it leads us to thinking that we're going to build a place at the expense of the people or instead of building the people. So our, our number one goal is thinking through how, how, how do we make bold bets on the people who live in here? Uh, in St. Paul, one of my signature initiatives is called College Bound St. Paul. We start every child born in the city with $50 in a college savings account. We mean every child. I tell moms are, that you know uh, St. Paul is the first city to, do, to launch a college savings accounts initiative that features automatic universal at, uh, enrollment at birth, with, which basically just means if you don't want your baby to have a college savings account, there's an application to fill out to not have one. Oh, okay. uh, because, because we mean every child. Uh, we were the first city in the country to launch a guaranteed income pilot uh, with public funding. Uh, we have uh, a couple of hundred families, low-income families of very young children who are right now are receiving $500 a month. Unconditional cash uh, support uh, for a period of two years. Uh, while, you know, alongside this organization called Mayors for Guaranteed Income, of which I'm one of the national uh, co-chairs, uh, as we do kind of an independent evaluation. And we're finding out that, you know, those folks who told us, Vernon, I don't know where you grew up, but I can tell you somebody told you, tell me if I'm wrong, somebody told you if you give money to a poor person, they'll just spend it on drugs and alcohol. Am I right or wrong? Well, I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia. I'm, yes, a, I'm a little bit older than you. Yes, so sir. I didn't see marijuana. You're, you're making that assumption. No, I've already looked it up. Uh, <laughs> All right. I'm, I'll, I'll be 77 this year, and you're 45. Yes, so, yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Well, That's true. Okay, you got me. So we didn't have drugs. We had alcohol. Uh, I didn't yeah. see marijuana until I was in college. So got it. So it, it wasn't drug and alcohol, but it was you can't be anything, boy. Yeah, you, that's you, right. You don't have it. You, you can't be anything. Now, that was the opposite right. from what my mom and dad told me, but that's what I got in school. That's what I got out in the streets. That's what I got. You can't be anything. That's Except right. you can play high school. Into, Go ahead. The, no, I hear you. And I'm saying we, we, we bought into these models. We have bought into these I, the ideas that people have told us that the poverty is a function of a lack of human character, right? Like you're somebody who can't be something. Uh, yeah. If you give money to that person, they'll just spend it on drugs and alcohol. They, you know, poor people are poor because they're lazy. They don't want to work. Poor people are poor because they don't know how to manage their money. Uh, Vernon, we through this organization I just told you about, Marriage for Guaranteed Income, uh, have since the start onset of the pandemic, have distributed over $250 million in unconditional cash support to Americans all over this country. Uh, all of which we're doing independent evaluation on, and all of which we're finding one that the dollars go ninety percent of those dollars go straight to um, uh, basic family necessities. Uh, two, that families are, are low income families are some of the best money managers uh, on the planet. You just can't find a better money manager than a than a than a low income single mom. And three, that when low income folks have money, they don't use it as an excuse to work less. They actually use it as an opportunity to work more uh, in city after city 
we're seeing uh, the employment rates among the people who are receiving these benefits uh, actually increase, not decrease. And when we ask them why, it becomes obvious. They say, oh, I fixed up my truck or I, I could afford to put my child in child care. Uh, and it's astounding the extent to which while we have built uh, at least a generation of public policy through this war on poverty uh, around this belief that poverty is a lack of character, what we're finding out is poverty is a lack of money. And when people have a little bit of money in their pocket, their ability to participate in our economy uh, just increases uh, dramatically. We're excited. We're going to talk to the uh, conference tomorrow about something called the local fund that we've created. We're exploring how the city government can be uh, can, can be instrumental in helping uh, low-income employees uh, buy the business that they work in uh, as a cooperative uh, business ownership model as we think through uh, all of the most incredible ways that we can imagine to build an inclusive economy right here in St. Paul. Well, you're talking about conversions, so I got it. But I want to go back real quickly and hit on. Yes, sir. Poor people are poor. Whatever comes after that because of, it's always pointing at the poor person. Something That's they right. didn't do right, something that they didn't That's do right. wrong, something they are spending money on depreciating assets as opposed to ap- appreciating assets. So it's always something right. pointing at the poor person, not That's looking exactly at right. what happened at Rondo or what happened at Tulsa or what happened with slavery or what happens when I, I got that call. I, we integrated in 1955. I got called the N word so much I thought that was my middle name. Okay, <laughs> almost. So right. It, it, we've been put down so much that all we need is some hope and some opportunity. Give a poor That's person right. some hope. Now, I did have, and I, I want to get back to what you're doing with these conversions, but I had a lady on the show named Dame Pauline Green who was the president of the International Cooperative Alliance, and she said co-ops help people to come out of poverty with dignity. Mm-hmm. That dignity, hope, that is what helps people to come out of poverty and that giving them some chance, chance, and that's what a conversion, where they get to own the property, but they also learn how to manage that property. They get to own the business, and they learn how to manage that business. And there is where the dignity comes in. They have a voice. So, yes, I, I agree with everything you're saying, bro. That's been my experience. Yeah. No, that's what thought about. And, you know, what? the other piece of this that we're interested in exploring as well, we won't be talking about this as much tomorrow, uh, but because uh, that's not necessarily our first focus. But the other piece of this, renter-owned cooperative housing. And one of the really intriguing things that, that, that I've learned uh, that becomes obvious when you think about it is the extent to which our low-income residents, uh, our low-income workers, uh, they're the ones who are the engine that creates all this economic opportunity. So when we think about a big business, uh, those dollars are earned by frontline employees working in a factory, those frontline employees working at a sales desk, frontline employees kind of doing doing the hard work. When we think about a, a big apartment building, all of the mortgage, all of the debt, all the management, all the landscaping, everything that it takes uh, to run that business is paid for by low income renters. And so the question is how do we just get uh, low income Americans, not anything extra really, but how do we get people to have the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in the economic opportunity that their work, uh, that their rent uh, creates for us. I actually missed one of the most exciting things I think that we're working on and that's a program we call the Inheritance Fund that we launched a couple of years ago, Vernon. Uh, and I've been telling you about Old Rondo and how those 700 homes were taken. We launched a program called uh, the Inheritance Fund a couple of years ago that uh, provides uh, low-income descendants of Old Rondo, people whose family uh, had a property ta- had at least one property taken on Old Rondo, um, with up to $110,000 in fully forgivable financing uh, to purchase or renovate a home. Uh, our first uh, recipient to take advantage of that bought a 200, I think it was a $240,000 home, maybe $220,000 home with $90,000 of forgivable financing from the city. And so our goal really is to facilitate wealth creation. Uh, We talk a lot about equity. In my bio, it says I'm a champion for equity. And the funny thing about that word is I get that word not from the social justice movement. That word for me comes from business school. 
uh, when my business school dean at Florida A&M University, you asked me about my education. I went to Florida A&M University, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, one of the largest and livest historically black colleges in the country. And my daughter's going there next year. Uh-oh. But when my business, yeah, you know it. So when my business school dean said equity, she was talking about money. She was talking about uh, ownership, uh, being able to own something that you can pass on to your child. Uh, she was talking about participation and decision-making power. Because if, if I own equity, then that means I get to vote on important uh, decisions. Uh, and she was talking about a participation in a shared economy. So when we talk about equity in the city, we're not talking about some amorphous concept of fairness. We're talking about people have money, people owning assets, uh, and people being able to be a part of the decision making processes in our community. I love hearing you talk, bro. Now I used I taught at Howard. I taught in the business school, and so yeah, all right. Equity is critical. Net worth, getting that equity up. That's right. Um, and they're not two different definitions. There's not a social justice definition of equity and a business definition of equity. To me, equity is equity. It's always got to be a money word. And if it's not, I'm not interested in the conversation. <laughs> well, it is a money word in my world. Um, That's right. So I got to know about co-ops because I started a management company, a property management company in Washington, D.C., and I started manage- sure. managing limited equity housing co-ops. And I watched mainly black women, middle-aged, older black women, run a business, mm-hmm. 500000 of income, $2 million of income, and often at best having a high school degree. But they got the training mm-hmm. they needed in the co-op world. The fifth principle of cooperation is education, training, and information. So I f- also found out that these limited equity housing co-ops, and when I first heard about them, it was from a white guy. And I thought it was white folks trying to make sure that blacks could not get equity because it was limited equity mm. housing co-ops. It's the name of it. Mm-hmm. But I found out, I started, as I got into it and I managed, their only other option was a low-income apartment building where they had no equity, they did not learn anything, they did not get That's right. both social and uh, economic wealth, that this is a great model. So I, I put that out for you, too, as a possibility for multifamily is a limited equity housing co-op. And HUD used to have a lot of money for that. Uh, and, they, and the research said that they were much better than any other HUD-financed uh, units for all over, for benefit of the persons that live there. It was mm-hmm. much, much better than anything else that's out there. Um, so, sir. I believe that. I yeah. believe that. You know, and, and even as we launch into kind of cooperative uh, models for business ownership, you know, we're seeing – uh, immediate, you know, just increases uh, in net worth. Uh, we're seeing increases in wages. We're seeing, uh, you know, a longer job tenures, kind of all those types of things. And, you know, our, our goal is to sort of shift this sort of negative cycle, this vicious cycle, this negative synergy uh, that poverty creates in people's lives, right? Uh, because poverty isn't a destination. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a journey, right? Uh, and think about how do we shift that? Uh, to create positive synergies, you know, and, and, and exactly what you just, you were, you were just describing, you know, again, when, 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 when I'm paying my thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or whatever it is of, of, of rent every month, but building no assets, building no equity, building nothing to show for it. Well, no, I'm building assets and equity, but for someone else, for somebody not for else. my own family. Right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, how do we, how, how do we start to chip away at that? I, I love the model that you just described. And that, this is one of the reasons. Um, I don't know that, you know, it, it's a new thing, I think, for cities uh, to think through not just how do we get some 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 uh, homes built, but how do we facilitate wealth creation uh, through those homes uh, mm-hmm. in an intentional way for folks who don't already have wealth? I, I think it's a new focus. So it's something that we're sort of building uh, on the runway, per se. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's exciting to have a, a room full of folks who are all passionate about that same thing in different places around the country so i just want to bring up something to you also in chicago there's a company called shy fresh and okay. it was started by five formerly incarcerated people i think four were black women and one black male and they've been highly successful and when i've studied co-ops that have incarcerated people in them whether they're in italy or puerto rico or here the mm-hmm. benefits are phenomenal. The, the, and the number, the first one is you get like a, somewhere between a 1% and 4% rate of return back to the prisons. Where without these, you're getting 60, 70%. Right. 60. Yeah, return. 
So just having a home, a, a business, a family that one can work into and they have this, you know, they, when you give people voice, okay, right. they know that they are being heard and considered, okay, they just have so much more dignity and worth. And that's one of the things that they get. Plus, they have everything you just talked about, higher income. They can have a say in when they go to work. Um, Shy Fresh is starting a um, a housing co-op and is starting a child care co-op because that's the number one problem for women is child care. It's in the cost of child care. So, yeah, there's all kinds of possibilities. Sir, I know you're, you've got to leave, and we've got a minute or so before we go to break. You got it. So but what message would you like to leave people with Mayor Carter? There's a new model. There's a new approach. There's a, there's, there's a better way. You know, I know we're all used to this kind of, this, this kind of approach of, of betting against folks, of building place in a way that people become sort of uh, incidental. Uh, but there's a new approach. There's a new model. There's a group of folks in St. Paul right now who are focused on that, uh, and it's coming soon to a town near you. So, you know, I, I look forward, and, and you know, we're excited to work with mayors around the country who are who are passionate about this type of type of approach, uh, and we're excited to show the world. Um, and I, I don't just mean St. Paul, but I mean this this movement of folks, uh, the Office of Financial Empowerment around the country, uh, the the mayors for guaranteed income across the country. Uh, there's there's a real, uh, I think, groundswell. Uh, and undercurrents right now in America of folks who know that we can do better by people. Uh, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Brad, I, I think you're going to lead the way. There, there's a lot going on around the U.S. And you can lead the way, particularly here in St. Paul, with your enthusiasm, your, your, well, I don't your know. energy, I'm, I'm, your I'm intelligence. I'm following our incredible staff. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. I have to say I'm following our incredible staff. And I'm right alongside some real amazing uh, leaders around the country. We're excited to have Nexus Partners to be an amazing partner who's doing a lot of the thinking, a lot of the work for us. So I don't know if it's fair to say I'm leading the way, but I'm sure as a heck enjoying being a part of the journey. Well, Christina is just walked in. She's going to be on from ne Nexus. She'll be on the next half. Thank you, Mayor. Love See it. you tomorrow. All right. All right. Hi, Christina. Take it easy. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Co-op. We have two new guests, Christina Nicholson from Nexus. And the mayor just talked about the company where she is from. And then we have Jessica James, who's a community loan advisor. Ladies, we've been on the air now. This October will be 11 years. And the National Co-op Bank has been our main financial sponsor those whole 11 years. So I just want to give a shout out to NCB. They were created in the 80s for the cooperative. They, their customers are co-ops and their members, and they provide innovative financial services for them. Have either one of you worked with NCB? I have tangentially. Uh, my wife works at National Co-op Grocers, and so they have a strong relationship with NCB, and so I've been at conferences with members of NCB before. Okay. So, Christina, since you were talking, why don't you tell us what you do? Sure. So, as you mentioned, Vernon, I work at Nexus Community Partners here in the city of St. Paul. Uh, my title is Cooperative Finance Developer. And so, uh, I appreciate your question about NCB because, again, as you've alluded to, uh, capital for cooperatives is a unique niche. And so that's part of the work that I do is looking for opportunities to bring capital to cooperatives in unique ways. Uh, and that's been part of our relationship with the city of St. Paul. Um, we've been able to partner with them on a substantial grant uh, to build out cooperative real estate ventures as well as worker owner cooperatives here in St. Paul. Okay. So I want to talk to you about some of those ventures. But before that, Jessica James. What is a community loan advisor? <laughs> so primarily my focus is to get folks who are predominantly low to moderate income and BIPOC into home ownership. 
So predominantly it is mortgage financing, but my background actually started in that community space with my time at Shared Capital Cooperative. Um, and so that's kind of what got me into the community space as well as the cooperative space. I did work a lot with NCB just due to the fact that they had a lot of, um, you know, participations in relationship with Shared Capital Cooperative in the past. And just being able to find um, different ways to uh, source capital, um, whether that be for home ownership or for uh, business ownership, I think that, you know, providing some sort of capital to um, put yourself in a position where where you're able to be able to grow and sustain wealth is really one of the biggest caveats that I try to uh, practice with my profession. So the mayor just talked about wealth creation. That's one of the things that he wants to do. So let's go back, uh, Christina. Where are you from and where did you go to school? Sure. So I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Go Chiefs. And um, my undergraduate degree is from University of Missouri, Columbia. I moved here under after my undergraduate and work was completed, uh, followed some friends up and kind of fell into retail natural foods cooperatives um, and fell in love with it, truthfully. And so I worked my way through a number of roles in natural retail cooperatives starting as a cashier and when I wrapped up I'd been general manager of two different co-ops and had built two stores for one of the local cooperatives as well as their project lead. And then I went back and got my master's uh, in business administration here in the Twin Cities at Hamlin University because I really wanted to pivot and my background, uh, I kind of said I had two roles. One was around cooperatives during the day and then grassroots organizing at night. And so my role at Nexus allows me to synergize and bring those two communities together with an understanding of capital and cooperative development, focusing on underserved communities and, quite frankly, communities that have been intentionally divested from. So that's my work at Nexus. It, it truly is a nexus of my passions and, and my belief that we all do better when we all do better. We all do better when we all mm -hmm. do better. I love it. Yes. And what I want to get to are some of the projects you've been working on. Mm -hmm. So, Jessica, you want to tell me about a project you've been working on? Yeah. Um, so, in here in the state of Minnesota, I think it's really interesting that Christina just said, like, that, that like, intersectionality, right? Like, we all have our day jobs. But then I sit on several boards here locally in the state of Minnesota predominantly related to home ownership. Um, there is about $230 million that just dropped in the state of Minnesota for first-time home buyers to obtain down payment assistance anywhere between thirty-two dollars and $35,000. So in my work with uh, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, we are creating um, a couple of different opportunities for consumers to just come out and get more information and education about down payment assistance, what it takes to qualify. Um, people don't understand that in order for you to get down payment assistance, right, there's a first mortgage component. So what do I, what are the steps? What do we got to do to get and be able to sustain this home ownership? And, and those are kind of some of the bigger things that, that we're working on right now, just really providing that education. I do probably over, I don't know, 15 to 20 home buyer education seminars every year um, as part of my, my work. Um, and then really just kind of making sure that we're giving all that information for financial opportunity and wealth, whether that be by way of business development, because MCCD, I sit on their loan committee now as well, um, or as it relates to home ownership, whatever I can do to um, provide some insight and input into the decisions that are being made on behalf of some of these consumers is what I find uh, my passion to be currently. Well, you just light up when you talk about it. <laughs> I, do. I do love it, yes. Okay. It's difficult, but I love it. So have you worked at all in any co-op housing? So at my time at Shared Capital, I actually closed quite a few different uh, cooperative home uh, homes like we did Pico Housing, for example. Yeah, we did. Uh, that is a housing cooperative based in Chicago. I want to say they're one of the oldest, I believe, um, housing cooperatives. So uh, they're pretty big. Nicomas was, was another one of them that we, we really worked on. So yeah, I've had my fair share of housing cooperatives. Not sure I really want to live in one, right? But 
to each their own, but uh, I definitely. Well, uh, I got to tell you, I live in a okay, housing okay. co op. It's a market rate co op. Um, there's always issues in any business. There's always issues dealing with people, but I love the co-op because it is a community. You know people and people know you and they're concerned. I was in the hospital this time last year. People sent me cards. One bought me flowers. Want to know how you were doing. So that community is what makes it, but there's, there's always something to deal with. Yeah, for sure. Like, let me let me retract and say that I just don't want to live in an apartment with a bunch of people. But the community concept that you get from the cooperative model is what keeps me here. Right. Like if I could come up with a concept where we could take single family homes and create a cooperative model. You can. They're there. I know. There's one in New York, but it's difficult, right? So you got to get the whole block, the whole community on board. So that's the thing. But that's what I like. It. Or build it. Or build if it. If you build it, they will come, right? So, <laughs> so that's kind of the goal. It's to see what other type of models we can present to be able to be more expansive as it relates to cooperative development. So I've owned about five houses in my life. I wanted the multifamily so I don't have to cut the grass. Right. I don't have to fix the roof. I, okay. Yep. Christina. Yes. Tell us about some of the projects that Nexus is working on, particular employee owned co ops, worker owned mm -hmm. co ops. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, I'll kind of do two framings. So for folks outside of the region, St. Paul and Minneapolis are referred to frequently as the Twin Cities. So um, in the city of St. Paul, we did a transition last year, a worker owner transition, a small marketing company called the Improve Group. Uh, the owner was really interested in looking at a transition plan. She was uh, mid-career, had built the company up for 18 years and was looking to be able to transition to follow some of her other passions. And so she met with her financial broker and her broker reached out to us and said, well, tell me more about this employee ownership. How does that work? Where does the capital come from? How are the deals made? And so we were able to successfully partner with them. It took us about 16 months. and 16 or 60? 16. Okay. One six. So it took us about 16 months uh, to do training with staff, get the new board in place, and uh, negotiate the deal. And so we were able to successfully negotiate that. And they are looking at applying for a small grant through uh, the local fund, which is our partnership with City of St. Paul, uh, that does some uh, small $30,000 grants to support organizations that took a hit during COVID. So um, that's a two point five million dollar fund. Two point five. Yes. So it's in two tranches, if I may. I think this might be an interesting design piece of it. Uh, one tranche is one point two five million for worker ownership startup and conversions. Right. So for worker owned cooperatives, the other one point two five million is for cooperative. Uh, real estate ownership, so either mixed use or commercial ownership. So really what we're trying to get at with that, uh, one example actually is in St. Paul. It's the Baker Building and it had multiple tenants. It was an older building. The owners wanted to sell it and because of the age of the building, the tenants weren't confident that that building wasn't going to be torn down because it's sort of been built around. There's been office complexes that have been built around them. Mm -hmm. So they weren't confident that they were going to be able to maintain the, the building itself, which is uh, architecturally significant. So uh, we did some free technical assistance with them and helped them buy the building. Uh, and so now the tenants of the business center own the building. Um, and both those projects are in St. Paul. We also have projects in Minneapolis. Uh, we did a conversion with a cleaning company, Happy Earth Cleaning, became worker owned four years ago. We actually did that in partnership with Project Equity nationally. And so, yeah, so we've done a number of projects in Minneapolis as well as in St. Paul in the last five years. Okay. So I just want to get what local means. I got that local for your local fund. Mm -hmm. Is local owned cooperative assistance? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I love it. Two point five million dollars for technical assistance, assistance conversions, 
and existing co-ops. Correct, and that that includes working capital. So we have a range. the The small thirty thousand dollar grants are really for businesses hit specifically by co by COVID because this money is flowing to us through American Rescue Plan uh, through City of St. Paul. The grants that we provide for transitions or for startups, um, it's really working capital. So we're looking at between fifty and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in working capital. And in our small little boutique office, we do everything from pro formas to projections to governance to uh, decision making in a body, right? People are peopling. And so you have to support them in growing in their decision making capacity. So we do all that as a boutique development agency. Um, and because of our grassroots connections and the 20 years that we've spent in St. Paul and in the Twin Cities, we've built the relationships and reputation that allow us to do that work. And that's a significant part of it as well. So you have about 150 employees for all that work? Bless your heart. <laughs> uh, we have 26. We do partner with outside consultants, and I think that frequently, I think that's an underserved opportunity. We have outside attorneys and CPAs that we work with. There's also organizations nationally that do technical assistance. So we don't have to carry all this water ourselves, but we do have to be intentional about the milestones and the arc of the project so that we're supporting our partners and clients all the way through and they know what to expect and from whom. Okay. Jessica, do you have another example of a business that you are working with? Um, so for me, I actually do sit on the board for Network for Developing Conscious Communities, NDCC, of which we are having a great conference thus far. And I'm the treasurer of the board there. And one of the things that we uh, recently opened is our Ella Baker Women's Business Center. Um, and that's located in Baltimore. So just really a space where women can kind of go get affordable rent to be able to, you know, work in an independent space uh, for their own self-employment. It's also a co-working space as well. Um, and then just really kind of working to get some additional opportunities by way of technical assistance. As you know, we do the Cooperative Academy with NDCC as well. It's a session that we, we do for uh, cooperatives that are developing. So maybe they're starting up. They don't know which way to go. They don't know um, how to access the capital. They don't know, um, you know, how to engage members or what that membership structure looks like, or maybe even don't even know what type of cooperative they want to make, right? Like it might be a, a consumer. Is it going to be a worker? Is it a consume? Is it a hybrid, if you will? You know, there's multiple ways that you can look and uh, start a cooperative. So I think that that's one of the two biggest things that we're doing with NDCC right now is just the creating that women's business center as a space for them to come as well as an opportunity that we've recently been given to take that cooperative academy a step further by providing additional technical assistance uh, to those cohorts after the academy is completed. So you've mentioned a couple types of co-ops, a worker co-op and a consumer co-op. So just real quickly, it depends on who owns and controls the business. If the business is owned and controlled by the people that work in it, the employees, then it's called a worker co-op. And Christina had given us an example of that. And if it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, it's called a consumer co-op. And you have credit unions or consumer co-ops, housing co-ops or consumer co-ops. Uh, Rural Electric uh, is a consumer co-op, REI. Uh, recreational equipment is a consumer co-op. So if, if it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products and services, it's called a consumer co-op. And you could have like a food co-op, most of the time were a consumer. They were owned by the people that shop there. But there are some, one in D.C. called GLUT, that's owned by the employees. Okay, so it can be a worker co-op or a consumer co-op. But now, first one I heard was in Seattle was a hybrid Mm -hmm. And I think 60% owned by the workers and 40% no, by the workers and 60% ownership by the consumers. But you can have the people would decide what that breakup would be and whether it's going to be employee, consumer, or hybrid mm -hmm. or something else. Okay. So those are the different things. Now, this Ella Jo Baker, Ella Jo Baker was nominated into the Cooperative Hall of Fame a couple years ago. Mm -hmm and the unsung heroes as she was around uh, 40s and 50s 
um, and just did a lot of great things that most people did not know about her in today's world and all of the things that she did. So I'm glad you named that after her. She's just a phenomenal woman. Uh, phenomenal woman. And are you seeing a call for black women to own their own businesses or come together and start their own businesses? Both of you are shaking your head. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that Christina probably sees more of it firsthand. Um, you know, it's just like the single black woman, right? Like yes. they, they're the predominant providers yeah. generally for their household. I think it's like 70% of black households, the, the predominant care uh, provider is the black woman mm-hmm. it's not the man unfortunately right but what we're seeing is that yes more more women are taking that step because one as we know in the in this situation that we're in as far as work we're usually the lowest paid we're the less likely to advance uh, into uh, higher level positions there's less black women that are in uh, you know positions of power um, so I think that just being able to find a way for us to be able to move forward and grow and be successful on our own without having somebody tell us that maybe, you know, the, you're, you're being the angry black woman, right? Like you hate that stigma that's given to us. So I think that this has given us an opportunity. I think that there's just seeing some of these younger folks as well, just, oh, if you can, you know, this is the opportunity and the time for us to really advance and move forward and coming up with different business plans, different models, and a way to be able to grow, start, grow, and build our own business is really something that's been enticing to black women these days. So I think that just from a, you know, uh, business development perspective, I think that I know a lot of people at MCCD are, are more um, minority women versus men, but I think that you might have a better insight as to what. Be- before you talk, Christina, what's MCCD? I'm sorry, Metropolitan Consortium for Community Development. Uh, they are Which a- metropolitan? They're located in the city of Minneapolis, but they do work all over the state. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I didn't know if it was D.C., Baltimore, or no, metro it's, area. It's, it's, it's metro Minnesota. area. Okay. Yeah, Chicago, it's Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Minnesota. It's local. Okay. You're going to give us an example? Or two? Well, so what Jessica is sharing, and I appreciate that, Jessica, two things. There's that African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right? And I think that that, that resonates with a lot of the people we serve in community because it, – to be blunt, and you've certainly talked about this on other episodes, this model of late-stage capitalism where everyone is out for their own interests um, is not sustainable. And so in our work, why I think we are in a unique moment is we are combining our understanding of economics with the impacts of grassroots development. And certainly this work has been happening for many years in the Twin Cities. I think the murder of George Floyd really galvanized people to understand we are all we have. And that realization that it is at the grassroots level, it is at the level of your neighborhood, your community, your neighbors, people that you eat with, that you walk your dogs with, um, that you see at the store, those are the people that are going to have your back. And so what does it mean to learn how to enter into an endeavor together, how to negotiate that fairly and legally, but also to have shared interest and culture and connection that sustains and buoys you and allows you to be your whole self without a lot of the performative constraints that we see in most conventional workspaces. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Mayor Carter had talked about some of the results, uh, higher pay, less turnover, people staying in their jobs longer. Um, he, what he didn't say is one of the things that I have seen is that people are happier. Absolutely. They like going to work, like being involved when it's a co-op and they have shared responsibilities, when they have a say in when they work and in, in, in their scheduling. All of this makes a difference in the humanity, and that's what you can get in in co-ops, and that's what I hear you ladies talking about. Also, I think leadership, though. I think one of the things that's been really powerful for me in doing governance development work, uh, particularly in communities of color, is the leaders we need are already among us. There's no secret sauce to being a leader. Uh, It's about access and support 
and um, ongoing ability to make a mistake, learn from it, and keep moving. And rather than being under a microscope, it's about really being in community and understanding that we're going to grow together and we're going to grow at the speed of trust and our shared knowledge. Um, and to me, that cooperative difference is why you have higher wages. It's why you have less turnover, because the foundation is so much more stable and so much more grounded in the values of our common shared interest in humanity. And you can't manufacture that in a C-suite. In a what? C-suite. <laughs> C-suite is your corporate suite. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, you cannot get that in a corporate suite. And when, um, when I got my MBA, I worked in a corporate. I worked for the assistant to the president of a major 500 company, and you just didn't get that. No. You didn't. You, you, no. <laughs> no. And it was a manufacturing company, and so... Things just didn't go down. The people on the manufacturing floor didn't get that either. They didn't have that sense of humanity. Mm -hmm. It was everything brought from top down, not bottom up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where do you see this all going? So I've worked, I alluded to this earlier, um, I worked in natural food cooperatives here in the Twin Cities for almost 25 years. And what was interesting to me is it was really viewed as sort of second wave cooperative. So there was sort of this first wave cooperative actually that took place in the 30s, sort of formally around the Great Depression. Then the second wave, as I'm sure, and I know you've discussed prior, um, happened in the, the 60s around people reclaiming their food um, and reclaiming sort of their food systems, right? So there's the second wave cooperative. Hippies, hippies, hippies. Hippies, 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 right? So moving here, um, what was interesting to me is the retail cooperative food spaces I was in were almost exclusively white. And having grown up in Kansas City, Missouri, that wasn't my lived experience to be in almost exclusively white spaces. And so that created a lot of cognitive dissonance for me, which is why I ended up doing a lot of grassroots work in addition to my day job. This wave, this third wave, is really about the global majority and our neighbors and community members who are tied to that global majority stepping into a space of leadership understanding that there has to be a, a different way to move forward and so i really do see this as a third wave and i see this third wave being led by communities of color who are at a moment where they understand that their vision for how things can be different is the vision that we need to move towards and i think more and more people understand there has to be a different way and I think that we're at a moment where that different way is emerging, and that is a different way in terms of caring for one another, caring for community, creating viable jobs that sustain people, um, creating uh, jobs that pay a living wage, and creating a foundation for our communities to thrive with. So that's third wave to me, and I see that happening here. So for me, I feel like I'm almost on the opposite side of the spectrum, right? I've lived here all my life, all my life, all in Minnesota. I grew up on the south side of Minneapolis. I, I lived for 20 years, like three blocks from where, from Floyd Square. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I see is I was always surrounded by predominantly white people. That, that was what it was. So when I kind of got into the cooperative space, which wasn't very long ago, mind you, it was probably only about 10 years ago, I was like, why doesn't anybody know about this? You know, why is there, why is there no information, no resources? This is an excellent, it's an amazing business model. It's a good way to sustain. So for me, it was just about how can I get the word out, right? How can we tell people and how can we help them understand that by doing this and providing that collective and collaborative nature within their own businesses, that that's how they're going to be sustainable. I think that one of the things we did see is that with shared, you know, for example, most of the cooperatives did not go under. And that's important. So I think that that's something to take away. Yeah, most cooperatives performed statistically better during COVID than other retail businesses. I, um, I like, Christina, your third wave. Although I gotta tell you, that would be a third wave perhaps in the U.S. But Dr. Jessica Gordon Imhar's book, Collective Carriage, says that we brought co-ops on the ships, in the bottom of them ships, 
we brought co-ops over here where we had mutual borrow funds. We had susus, which we saved monies together. This is a part of black folk. And I think there's a lot of reasons we don't know about it, and it was kept away from us because of the capitalistic model, but we don't have time to go into it because we have to leave now. I love you ladies. I thank you so much for being on with us. What a pleasure. Thank you for having us. And everybody else, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. The preceding program was paid for by Everything Co-op.